pray, pray, pray real quick. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just want to uh, thank you for being a wonderful and loving Father to us, God. For um, chasing after us, for um, who's coming after us, God, day after day. Even when we don't come to you, Lord, um, you're there waiting for us, God. So, um, you know, June says about the, the worship leader, it's uh, got a lot of merit to it. But there were some parts of the songs that you didn't sing, which I think maybe then God has something special for you that you'll see from, from his word today. I don't know, but we'll see. Um, the first passage I'd like to look at is Revelations 2. Here are your Bibles with you. And uh, so here God is talking to John uh, about the church in Ephesus. And he says, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So here God is talking to the church in, in Ephesus, and he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. That just kind of sets up everything I'm going to be speaking about today. It's not actually the main passage, but um, that's written to the church in Ephesians about 30 to 50 years after the passage that I'll be sharing with you. Um, so, yeah, Advent season is here, Christmas is coming, we just had Thanksgiving, and I'd like you to take a moment and just think past uh, this past week, uh, and even maybe in the next couple of weeks, about things that you did to feel full, or things that you'll be doing to feel full. Obviously, with Thanksgiving, uh, Pastor June loves to eat at our, at, our, at our dinner, so maybe it's food. Perhaps for some of us, it's work. And for others, maybe it's a vacation or enjoying a day off with the family. Uh, and maybe for others, it's uh, a good workout or some other hobby. But whatever it is that helps you feel full or satisfied, now, what do you think about where you are right now, though, in terms of fullness? At this very moment, do you still feel full or filled? Is life satisfying and filling you up beyond measure? And we spend our days and months filling ourselves with things of this world. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't enjoy um, God's creation, you know, our communities, our passions that God has given us. But I am saying that there is a better way to stay filled, and to become more resilient to the things of this world. Like I said, we saw in Revelations 2, the believers in Ephesus were surrounded by false gods. Princess, uh, the goddess Diana was the big one, Artemis. Uh, probably people were practicing uh, magic arts, worship of false gods, and there was a big influence of false apostles during that time. And it made it a necessity for the believers in Ephesus to stay focused on Christ and to stay true to their first love. And so when we read it in Revelations 2, it says that they had forgotten their first love, right? And so Paul, in this letter here to the Ephesians, is praying that they would be filled with the fullness of God. And just as Paul prayed, I think that's something that we need to do also. So my sermon today is titled, uh, Praying for Intimacy with God. And I kind of wish James had been here and Phil, because we used to joke about this uh, when we did our prayer times uh, before band practice, and I'd always make fun of James for praying for intimacy with God. And I said, well, why don't you just seek after it? Why are you praying for intimacy? But I think it makes sense now. Uh, and so 
the main passage here that we're going to be reading from is Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And it's Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. I'll read that real quick. And Paul prays here, uh, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory of the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So today what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at three ways to seek God so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And the first way that we seek God so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God is praying for God's strength. And we're going to look verse by verse here. So if you look at verses 16 and 17, uh, Paul says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, right? Um, so what is Paul doing for us? He's praying. And in a lot of Paul's letters, he prays uh, for the people that he's praying for, right? the uh, people in Galatia, people in Ephesus, uh, Timothy, all these people. Paul's always praying uh, for his believers, asking them to pray for him, and also for each other. And so I think uh, prayer is a big part of Paul's life. And it's, uh, so what we want to look at is what he's praying for. And Paul prays here that out of God's glorious riches, uh, the NLT will actually say glorious unlimited resources, meaning that God's riches are abundant and limitless. And it's from this abundance that Paul is asking God to empower us, the believers. So Paul prays that out of God's glorious riches that God the Father would strengthen us in our inner being. Uh, some other translations will use inner man, which means it's just the inner being where, where Christ can work within you. Uh, and so we're asking that he would empower us through his spirit, strengthen you with the power through his spirit. In other words, we cannot be strengthening ourselves. We need someone, something else to do that. And it's by the power of God, the Father, through the Holy Spirit that we can be strengthened. Um, and as I said, we're, we're, Paul is praying that we strengthen our inner being, right? This is where God is wanting to work, where he's at work. And the dictionary defines inner man as a person's spiritual being, or their mind, soul, or nature. Right? This is where God's work begins after we become saved, and this is where our spiritual life exists and grows. And so Paul prays that out of God's unlimited resources, that God may strengthen us with power through the Spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts. Now, this is not to be confused with salvation. Uh, Paul is clearly uh, addressed that he's been speaking to believers in chapters 1 and 2 of Ephesians. And so when he prays that Christ may dwell in your heart, he's speaking about how much is Christ dwelling within you. This is a process of growth and spiritual maturity. And it's in its essence seeking intimacy with God. But it can only happen with the power of the Spirit. Mm. And when I was born, uh, my mom, my mother, she uh, dedicated me to God. And I'm not talking, you know, infant baptism or uh, infant dedication. I'm talking about a Hannah and Samuel type of dedication. If you know anything about Hannah, uh, she left Samuel there at the church would be like, just short of that, that's pretty much what my mom was doing. So she's been praying for me to become a, a pastor since I was born. Amen. <laughs> <clears throat> Funny how things work out. <laughs> uh, anyway, my, uh, my Korean middle name is uh, Sung Han, which literally means holy consecrated, or in other words, it's dedicated to a religious or divine purpose. And so, you know, I remember as I was growing up, um, she'd always tell me the importance of the name, how she's praying for me to become a pastor, and, uh, and oftentimes I would laugh it off and just say that there's no way. Okay. <laughs> I just started, this is terrible. Um, you know, as I grew older, um, I would grow farther and farther away from that calling. And uh, 
I did everything I could to stay away. Uh, you know, before I entered seminary, I actually had a great job. Um, I was working, uh, it was close to six-figure income. It wasn't bad, and, uh, but that's when God began to stir my heart. And it was kind of right around the time that, um, actually maybe about a year before I came into life. And so during that time, uh, you know, I just felt like I needed more, I wanted more of God, and something was just not there. I think that's what Ewan was talking about, his testimony. Um, you know, it's like this, you, you know God, but you don't really know him, and that's kind of what I was going through, and I wanted to experience that, and I started doing a lot of research on prayer, how to hear the voice of God, and um, just really praying for an experience. I asked God for strength to be able to understand this, and it was a real struggle. You know, I remember sitting in a room just praying and trying to hear God, and it, you know, an hour or two would go by. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know how God was speaking. And I got so frustrated um, because I didn't know. I don't think I knew how God spoke. There was no relationship there and stuff. Uh, but you know, I did keep on, and I would ask God to strengthen me. I prayed that Christ would dwell within me. I didn't know what that looked like or what it would do, but it was a start. So I want to ask you today, are you in a similar state as I was a few years ago? Has your life become stale? Have you realized there's something missing in your life and that no matter how hard you try, you don't feel full? I want to encourage you then to start praying that God would strengthen you. Mm -hmm. The power of the Holy Spirit and that Christ may dwell within you so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, the first way that we seek God so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God is by praying for God's strength through the power of the Holy Spirit so that Christ can dwell in us and work within us. The second way that we seek God so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God is to pray for power that God would give us insight to understand Christ's love. In verse 18, we see here, we read, May, uh, and I pray that you, I'm sorry, it's part 17 here, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So first we pray that we'd be empowered by the Holy Spirit, that our inner being would be strengthened and that Christ would dwell within us. And the next part of the process here is that uh, as we're empowered by the Spirit, our inner being is strengthened so that Christ can dwell within us. And then we become rooted and established in that love. And so when we read this, here Paul's emphasizing that we want to be rooted, like you can think of like a plant or tree, and established in love. And some of the other translations will use the word grounded. Uh, you can think of like a structural foundation of a tall building. In fact, in chapters 2 of Ephesians, Paul tells us that Christ is the chief cornerstone, and that we as the body of Christ are built on the foundation of the apostles, and that in Christ the whole building is joined together. So this is through the power of the Holy Spirit, with Christ dwelling in us. And again, Paul prays for power to do what? He wants us to understand, to grasp, to comprehend with God's holy people, with the other believers. In other words, uh, he wants us to comprehend, and we see here, how wide and long and how high and deep is Christ's love. Now, Ephesians is actually filled with a lot of this type of language. It's this cosmic language. And Paul refers to God in terms of being without boundaries, being limitless, and having this abundance. And so we imagine the width and length of the horizons and the expanse of the universe. And if we imagine the height and depth uh, of the heavens, right, the deep trenches of the earth, I think that's, we can only begin to imagine uh, the vastness of Christ's love for us. Uh, I mentioned earlier how I began to grow in my spiritual life, and so I had begun to pray to experience God, and um, yeah, I wanted to know God more. I prayed God would strengthen me with the Holy Spirit, that He would dwell within me, and I start, as I started seeking God more, I made God more of a priority in my life. So God began to work within me. Right? I came to New Life and started doing discipleship with Pastor June. We, our first session was actually really great. That's where I kind of learned to hear the voice of God. And um, I think that was the first time I really experienced it. But I began to see um, God's goodness. I began to see his faithfulness. And I began to see uh, his love for me. And... Yeah, it's funny because I, I think I started to see things so differently. I started to look at my job. 
my income. Like that was nothing that I did. It was all a gift from God. And I thought so foolishly that was me doing all that, that all that stuff. And um, it wasn't. It, this, it was all a gift from God. And apart from God, I really had nothing. Right. Romans eleven thirty six will say for from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. It was out of this, uh, out of God's goodness and grace that I even had the job. It was out of God's goodness that I would be able to make any money. And I started to change that, the way I saw things and viewed God. I started to understand that Christ's love for me was bigger than I had ever thought or imagined. And I began to know Christ more intimately. And a relationship started to form. And it became clearer and clearer that God really knew me. He didn't confuse me with any other John Camden. If you're Korean, you know this is <laughs> the most common name that anyone could have as, as a Korean, but uh, a Korean American, I guess. But he knew me, and he knew me specifically. And through these experiences, I started to know who God was and how he exceeded um, all the limitations that I had put on him. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 6, 9, that this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Tim Keller has a great sermon on how to pray, and he says Jesus was the first person to refer to God as Father. And so Paul in this prayer prays to the Father. That's how he starts off, right? For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Um, and Tim Keller says it's uh, our Father is the basis of prayer. We we have to come and to understand God as Father, not like our earthly fathers who fail us because they're human. I know for a fact as a, as a father that's definitely the case. Even though I love my children dearly, uh, I fail them constantly. But it's really about understanding that we're adopted children of God, the Father who loves us as much as he loves the Son. So how do you understand God, the Father's love for you? How do you understand Christ's love for you? Mm. Is it conditional? Is it based on what you want or what you think should be happening? Is it based on the limitations of your earthly parents? If so, I want to challenge you today to remove that box that you put God in. And then ask God to show you the ways that he cares for you, the ways that he loves you, and the ways he has been a father to you. Open the Bible, begin to read how entwined God is with his people and how he loves them. It's completely throughout. And pray to God for the power to know the vastness of God's love according to the abundance of his riches. You cannot pray effectively without understanding God in terms of family. And so ask God for the wisdom and the insight to know the love of the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. So that's the second way that we seek God, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. And it's a prayer for power, that God will give us the insight to understand Christ's love. Uh, the third and final point that I have for today, um, in order to seek God, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God, is to pray for an encounter and an experience with God. Verse 19, I'll read verse 18 first. It says, um, To grasp how, hot, how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I don't know about you, if you heard anything funny there, I thought it was weird. Um, but the statement here, it says that you, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. I don't know what Paul's praying about here, but it sounds to me that it's, he wants us to know something that is unknowable, something that is, uh, something that we can't even grasp, right, to understand. Like, the audacity of Paul's prayer is actually quite uh, large here. Mm -hmm. And so I think what Paul's really praying about is that he doesn't, mean just to know with your head, right, with intellect. We can read about God, we can uh, do these things, but without experiencing God, without encountering God, we don't really know the love of God. Mm. It's about having a relationship with God. It's not intellectual, but experiential. And you see, this experience is transformational. It changes a person mm. when you experience God. And at the verse, end of verse 19, we see that experiencing the love of Christ coupled with God's strength and God's in insight is how we begin to become filled with all the fullness of God. Mm -hmm. You know, we all know what an apple tastes like. 
because we've tasted it. And we can describe an apple because we've seen it. And Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I can tell you about God's love for you, but you really do need to experience it to know what it tastes like mm. and to see what it looks like. There's nothing like experiencing the love of Christ. It really does transform and change you. Mm. And you can't be the same after experiencing God's love. It's actually impossible. If you talk to anyone who's experienced the love of God, I think they'll tell you the same thing, that their life was changed in that moment. We say it today, this, there's no going back. It's, mm -hmm. It impacts you. Um, the, the first year of seminary, when I entered in, um, my wife and I lived on the campus there. And uh, according to Pastor Junior, it was a dumb idea, but I decided to stop working. I think he called it stupid. <laughs> Rightly so, but I have three children. And um, I think it was, our, it was our second month in, it was in September. We were having a really hard time. I was having a hard time telling this one without um, getting too emotional, but I'll try today. Um, it was uh, that first year, though, when I really wanted to just surrender to God. Everything that we needed, you know, it was to let God work. And I felt very convicted by it. And, uh, you know, I think I'm so grateful for that year because it really did stretch me in so many ways. And we um, experienced God to these levels that we have never experienced. I do have a disclaimer here because um, sometimes when you share these kind of testimonies, people think it's about prosperity gospel. But if you know me, I'm not wealthy by any means. And so, um, yeah, the proof is in the pudding there. So our first month in, um, we were negative, I think it was like $135. And uh, we had no, um, we had no gas in the car that weekend. The light was on, I think. And um, I had to come to church to uh, help with worship. And so I remember specifically reaching out to Johan, who was leading that weekend, and um, asking him for a ride in the city at the time. So I got to church, God provided there. And then I was here, and uh, I remember Pastor June offering me a ride home, which was great, God provided there. But he did say uh, that I had to, he had to stop by my parents' office for some kind of seminar. So it was a long day we went, um, I got there. And my mom was asking me if I needed anything. And uh, I was just kind of sharing with her what was going on. And so she gave me um, her gas card to put in gas. And so on the way home, I remember um, talking with Pastor June about it. And he said that I should go home and pray with Esther, that we should um, add up everything that we needed. And that if God, if I felt convicted by God to do this, then God would be faithful and answer. And so the next day, uh, you know, we came to church and, um, well, actually, sorry, we went home. I went home that night. We did that. We, we, we prayed for a while, actually, and we added up everything. And um, it was a lot, a lot to feed three children and two adults. Actually, we only had two at the time, I'm sorry. Elijah was important. <laughs> um, but I just remember praying, and just right after I prayed with Esther, we just felt, I felt a lot of peace that day. So the next day I came to church, and um, we were here. I think that was Oasis too that night, uh, I think. And so um, everything was kind of winding down, and I remember someone giving me an envelope, and I was like, wow, what is this, you know? Um, but I was very thankful. I just think, remember thinking God right then and there, it's like, wow, maybe maybe our, our bank account will become positive this weekend, and that'll be great. And I remember just thinking that um, God answers quickly. And you know, it was through this exchange, 
and so many more that were to come that I was able to experience God's love for me in a very personal way. So in order for us to be filled with all the fullness of God, we need to experience God's love firsthand. This is not just having the knowledge of who God is, but again, truly experiencing Him and having a relationship with Him. Have you experienced God in a real and transforming way? Has your life been changed by an encounter with God? If you haven't, I'm going to ask you to pray and ask the Father that you may be able to taste and see that love of God, the love of Christ. If it's been a while, you can pray this too. It's okay. We all get bogged down by life. And we get so lost in, in what we're doing. So the third way that we seek God, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God, is by praying and asking God that we may experience Him mm. and know Him intimately through that experience. Amen. Um, you know, at the end of Paul's prayer, Paul concludes with a doxology, a word of praise. I had no idea what that word was before going into seminary. I remember being so confused by all the terms, ecclesiology, eschatology, all those things, <laughs> nonsense. Um, but the words here that Paul uses, um, the language that he uses, I think is so powerful. And I believe it's important to mention a couple of things in the doxology. And so as we pray for God's strength that Christ may dwell within us, as we pray that we be rooted and established in love, and understand God's love for us. And as we pray that we will experience the love of Christ so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God, we also need to believe that God has the power to answer these prayers. Mm -hmm. I, don't understand, I don't know if you guys understand, again, the audacity of Paul's prayer and what he's asking for. He's asking God for God to come and fill us with all of God's fullness. You know, we ask God for a lot of things, money, better job, better house, you know, and all those prayers, what they have in common is really just self, like what I need, what I think I need, what I think I, I want. I'm just as guilty, that's all I did my entire life, is have this laundry list of items that I prayed for. Expecting God to do something, right, for me, but when was the last time you prayed for yourself that you, or asked God that you would be filled with all of his fullness? When was the last time that you prayed for someone else that God would fill them with all of his fullness? And do you actually believe that that's possible? Do you believe that that can happen? And I can tell you honestly that if you believe God's word, it's there. Let's look at what Paul says in verse 20. He says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. If God can do so much more than what we think, our, our thinking, our ability to think is so limited. Come on. You know, when, uh, when Hannah prayed for a child, God answered her prayer. But he gave her more. He gave her six kids. I shared a story earlier um, about the envelope. And uh, I didn't mention anything about it, but um, I do remember clearly that day just thinking, God, I'm just, I just need a couple hundred bucks in there, and then we'll get by somehow. I don't know if I've ever shared this story with uh, anybody here. Yeah, Esther was over there by the, the kids' room. And I went to go find her and I just said, hey, you know, somebody gave this to us. She was a little surprised too. And honestly, I think maybe for both of us, we really did think it was just a couple hundred bucks. I don't know if I mentioned earlier, but uh, we needed $2,000 a month to live. 
at the time. Rent and whatever else. And so if you remember, we had prayed the night before and uh, we told God that's what we needed. You know, when we opened that envelope, um, I remember crying just like this. Because, uh, <laughs> it wasn't uh, 100 or 20 dollars it wasn't even two two grand uh, it was a check for four thousand dollars and i'm not saying that um you know, like this is how oh, god works all the time i'm not saying that um when you get wealthy from this kind of stuff, please don't forget who's behind the work. Come yes. on. It's God. Come on. Who gave us what we needed. Mm -hmm. What? Twice. So that we could just live, pay bills. Again, Hannah prayed for one child. She just asked and begged God for one. And God gave her six children. believe that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And as a father, um, I tell my kids no all the time. We go to the store and they want to buy this and that. And I say no. It's not always because um, I don't want to. Sometimes it's not good for them. You know. um, and in Matthew 7, 9 through 11, God says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, We'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts? <coughs> the experience here allowed me to understand God more. It helped me to understand Christ's love more. The effect is that now I know God just a little bit better than I knew before. I begin to move closer to him. It becomes my everything, filling me beyond measure with all of his fullness. So as I conclude today's message, um, I want you to ask yourself, what have I been filling myself with? Actually, can we have the praise thing come up? Sounds like an appropriate thing. <laughs> Based on from what I've observed. Because only Eric, she picked the song, and we can sing all the lyrics. <laughs>